Okay, now, in my opinion, the blacksmith was one of the most important, if not the most important, craftsperson, um, not just in the pioneer period, but long before um, that. The blacksmith, um, of course, is a master metal worker. So um, anything that was made um, out of metal, the blacksmith was the guy who made it. So um, you think about all the other trades um, from long before the pioneer period, all the way up to the pioneer period, um, and those trades, do they have to have any metal objects in order to do their job? And the answer would be yes. So think about if I was a farmer for a living. Metal items involved in farming? Let's see, my plow points, my mules have to have shoes on them, I'm going to need a shovel, an axe, a garden rake, all would have been made by the blacksmith. What if I was a cook for a living? My fork spoons, pots, pans, the crane that you swing the pot in and out of a fireplace, to, if you have a pot of something cooking, all would have been made by the blacksmith. What if I was a carpenter for a living? Yeah, nails. I need a hammer, I need a wood gouge, I need a plane, I need a saw, I need hinges if I'm making cabinets. Who do you think made all those? The blacksmith. What if I was a stonemason? Am I going to have to cut stones? You think I'm going to use a wooden tool for that or a metal tool? A metal tool. So the blacksmith was the guy who made all those. So if it wasn't for the blacksmith, um, we'd also be working with stone tools. Now, when did black mending start? Nobody knows. No written records really then. I mean, a thousand years ago, long before that, 2,000 years ago, long before that. Okay, so blacksmithing has been around for a long time. Now, the, the term blacksmith um, derives from, or the, at least half the word, smith derives from an old English word to smite or to hit. Okay, so what do you think a blacksmith is going to hit? A piece of metal. Now, are there other smiths other than just a blacksmith? Yeah. Tin smith, that's a metal. Gold smith, that's a metal. Silver smith, that's a metal. Pewter smith, okay? So Copper all smith. those were metals that got hit in some way, shape, or form to get shaped. A blacksmith, though, of course, the other ones, it denotes what they do. A tin smith works in tin. A gold smith works in gold. A silver smith, okay? But a blacksmith, black what? What's black, what they call the black metal, that's iron and steel. When it cools down, it turns to, once you've heated it up and it cools down, it actually turns a black color. So that's where the term comes from. So blacksmith means a hitter of iron. Okay, so what does a blacksmith do? Well, he takes a piece of metal stock. It can be like any of this over here. It can be little pieces like this. Uh, it can be way bigger than this. And he's going to heat that up and he's going to make that into something useful. He takes an ordinary piece of iron or ordinary piece of steel and he turns it into something useful. Now the best way I can describe it is, are we taking any metal away when we're shaping it? No, we're just moving it from point A to point B. So picture this. This is the best way I can explain it. We had a big wad of Play-Doh or a big wad of clay. Can I change the shape of that clay without pulling it off or adding stuff? Of course we can. Can we roll it into a ball? We can. If I lay it on the table and I roll it out, can I make a big, long, like, a noodle? Right? Can I change it again? We can wad it back up. We can roll it back into a ball. I can lay it on the table. I can hit it flat with my hand, make it flat like a pancake. Can we change it again? Of course we can. We can keep changing. Are we adding anything? Are we taking anything away? It's the same thing that the blacksmith is going to do, except his Play-Doh is going to be really hot. <laughs> okay? And of course he can't put his hands on it because it is so hot. So the blacksmith would come up with ways to manipulate that metal and basically just make extensions of his hands. So his hammer becomes an extension of his hand. Can I touch hot metal with this and not get burned? Of course I can. If it's a short piece of metal and it's too hot for me to pull out of the fire, I have all sorts of tongs I can use, which are extensions of my hand just like pinching it. This becomes an extension of my hand. This is the anvil. This is the shaping surface. We're going to shape the metal. All right. The vise becomes an extension of my hands. I can now take a piece of metal and clamp it in here. Now I have a hand holding it. And I can take a file 
to file on it or whatever and still have both my hands to manipulate the metal with. So a lot of the things in the life of the shop are just extensions of his hands to deal with that really hot, for lack of terms, Play-Doh that he's going to be playing with. Okay? So he can turn anything into a useful item. Now one of the things I always make on my tours um, is a useful little item, a tool called a pickle picker. Because pickle pickers are what you would have seen hanging in a general store because pickles didn't come in nice little glass jars like they do today. They came in a big wooden barrel. There could be four or five hundred loose pickles in the pickle barrel. And so you think the store owner wanted you to run your arm down into his pickle barrel to get a pickle out? Especially, he wouldn't want you if you were the blacksmith and your hands were nice and dirty and you had horse hair all over you and you were sweaty. Of course, would you want to be the guy behind me in line if I reach my arm down into the barrel to get a pickle? <laughs> of course not. So, we're going to make a pickle picker and this is what we're going to make it out of. A little small piece of square stock, just a quarter inch in size. And the first thing we're going to have to do is we're going to have to heat it up, of course. The blacksmith has to have a fire in order to do his job. Okay, so we talked about the anvil as one of his tools. One of the other important tools he has to have is an airflow of some sort. In this place of shop, it's what they call a bellows. This is a double lung. So it fills and blows every time you pull the handle. So you get one continuous stream of air. The air comes up, it goes through a pipe, and then it's connected to this portion right here, which is called the forge. And then there's a metal pot right in the middle. Just clear it off here. That's where you build your fire, and in the bottom of that metal pot, there's a series of holes cut in it, and the airflow connects there and comes up through those holes in the middle of the forge. We're burning coal in this shop. Prior to the American Civil War, um, blacksmiths would have burned homemade charcoal. That thing that they would have made, or there would have been a charcoal maker. Um, in the area, and that's all he did was make charcoal for the use uh, in the blacksmith shop. So, we'd have to heat that metal up. We're gonna work the bellows. This piece is gonna be long enough, I'm not gonna have to use the tongs. And the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna put a point right on the end of our metal. So it's flat right now, so we're going to shape a point right on the end. This is a piece of stainless steel, not a piece of uh, mild steel, so I have to heat it up a little hotter than usual. We're going to get our point. And we only have to work two sides of our metal because the anvil, the hammer and the anvil are doing the work. So if I'm hitting it on the top, the anvil is doing the same thing on the bottom. So we only have to work it on two sides at any given time. So we have it heated up. We'll put our point right on the end. So now we have our point right on the end, and now we're actually going to make this metal get longer. It's called drawing out. Now, did I take any metal away to put that point on there? All I did was move it. I have to be really careful working with stainless steel because stainless likes to crack right on the end when you start working it because it cools off so fast. So we're gonna, now we're going to make the, the point get longer. And we can do that several ways. We can do it on the face of the anvil or we can use part of the horn and put several big dents in the, on two sides and then hammer those dents out. And when we hammer those dents out, it will actually make the metal get longer. It's called drawing out. So we're going to draw this out. So 
and now we're starting to make it get longer and more of a point. It's like sharpening a pencil except we're not taking material off. We're just moving the material in one direction. Why do you have bells on the bottom of your pen? Because any good blacksmith should come equipped with all the bells and whistles. It was a joke between a bunch of other blacksmiths and myself when I put these on here, and they've been on here um, ever since. So, uh, so, but uh, I'm easy to pick out when we go do uh, demonstrations and whatnot. There may be 25 or 30 blacksmiths there. I'm, I'm usually the the spokesperson, and so now I leave them on because the group just says, "Go talk to the guy that's jingling over there." <laughs> so that's how they point me out in the crowd. So that's why they're still on there. It doesn't have any historic significance whatsoever. How many years does it take to become a master blacksmith? Uh, a lifetime. They, they use the word master. There really is no such thing as a master blacksmith. Um, I know a guy who's been blacksmith for 60 years, and he'll tell you that he does not know everything there is to know about blacksmith. And when I say he's been blacksmith for 60 years, he has been blacksmithing for 60 years. He's had a hammer in his hand for 60 years. And uh, there never is a true, true what you can say, master. Um, now, before they turn you loose and you consider you are a blacksmith, if you do an apprentice program, which is what they used to do, they would get boys that were somewhere around between the ages of 12 and 15 or so, um, and they would apprentice for seven years under a master blacksmith before they would be considered a blacksmith. And even then, when you get turned loose, you're only considered a journeyman blacksmith, not a master. So, it's crazy still, to think about, especially when in today's society, just to become a physician. So that's comparable in the years. You actually went and did, had more training to become a blacksmith than you did to become a doctor. Doctor for very much training. <laughs> and we'll talk about that, of course, when we start talking about this. All right, can y'all see? It's starting to get long, it's starting to get pointy. So, if we're going to make this so we can get, can we use that to get a pickle out of a barrel? No. Yeah. We could poke a pickle, but I don't think it would stay on there. <laughs> so, what we need to do is we need to put a hook on it. Before we put a hook on it, I want to make my hook on the end round. Right now, this, this point is still square. It's still four-sided. So, we're going to make it round first. So, we're going to, in order to make it round, what do I need to do? I have to heat it, and then I have to knock all the corners off. That's what I'm going to do. Instead of working it on the flat side, we're going to work it on the edge. And then what you actually do is you make it go from four edges into eight edges. off all the angles and eventually you can get it round for our purposes we don't need it to be perfectly round so now we have it fairly round round enough to make a hook out of it so now we're going to heat it back up and we're going to put our hook on it now by that didn't hear that on the road so what part of the animal do you think we would use to make the hook this? We could. That worked out really well. We could hammer it over here. You tend to get a, a very good spiral when you do it that way. You can actually, you tip it the right way, you can sit here and make a piece of come off and look like a pig's tail. It'll just keep curling and keep curling. Um, and so then you have to do a lot of tuning. So I showed you then how you can get your hook started. Um, you can actually make a hook by using the flat edges. Um, most people don't realize you can make a curve using a flat edge of an apple. <laughs> but you can. Since it's already got my hook started, now it's going to be kind of tuned up. So we're going to kind of hammer it towards ourselves. We're going to have to take that curl on the end off. Bigger hook. We're 
we're going to go for a smaller pickle though today. I'm going to get my curve in. I like to have a little bit more of a curve in there. How much you pour those? A pickle picker? Mm -hmm. This one's not going to be completed. It's not going to be decorative. I usually sell them if I'm at an event, they're $10 a piece. All right. Now, can we catch a pickle with that? Yes. We could. But you know what? Let's make it so we can take the pickle and push it to the side of the pickle barrel and hold the pickle there and then just turn the hook so the hook goes into the side of the pickle. That way, we don't have to get anywhere close. We can hold the pickle here and rotate the hook to make it go in. So in order to do that, we have to put a 90 degree bend in our pickle picker. All right. How do you start the fire? With a newspaper and a match. A pioneer bike that started his, he probably would have used what's called rich lighter pine, uh, which is the center of the pine, the pine tree. After it rots away, it leaves the very core of the tree. There's a lot of pine sap in it, and you can break it apart, and it'll light very easily. And uh, that's what they would use to light theirs. Would they use um, steel to help make the fire? Now, well, flint and steel, where you strike it, they would have, they, if they didn't, for the invention of matches, that's what they would have had to use. They would have had to use a flint, a piece of stone and a flint and strike it and catch it into a tinder bundle, and that's how they would have got their fire started. All right, so now we have our hook. Okay, so now we can push the pickle to the side of the pickle barrel oh, and hold, hold it there, <laughs> and then rotate that into the pickle and pull the pickle out of the pickle barrel. Okay, now. Is the store owner going to want us to throw the pickle picker on the floor? No, we're going to put some sort of handle on it. So we're going to do a real simple loop handle. Really easy. Does each of these hammers have a different purpose? Mm -hmm. um, each hammer does something different. I usually prefer to work with a cross peen. That's what I usually use. Um, so you have, a, of course, your flat anvil surface, and it all depends on how you strike your metal um, to get it to do what you want to do. You can do a full hammer blow, and this is the way that I learned how to do how to how to your hammer control. So it's called the cow patty method. So if we have a wet cow pie sitting on this anvil right here, and I take my hammer and I hit it. Flat to flat, anvil to face to hammer face, right directly in the middle of the cow patty. Which direction is the cow patty going to go? Everywhere. It's going to go in every direction. So what's the metal going to do if I do this? Every direction. It's going to move in every direction. So what would happen if I had the cow patty and the center of the cow patty was right here where it kind of went half on, half off the anvil. We could get it to float out there. And I did a half hammer blow. Which way is the metal going to go? It's going to go down and it's going to come straight back. Down and out. Go left and out. And go right and out. Okay? So, that's why you have a flat hammer surface. Alright? Now, what happens if I want to make the metal stay tight at the bottom and spread at the top? Could I do that with just a round, flat surface? You can. It's a little difficult, so could I do it with this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're gonna pinpoint your strike and you work it like a fan. So you start on the outside and it'll make like a fishtail. Alright, so the hammer face has a lot to do with what you can get the hammer to do. So this hammer is what they call a rounding hammer. So it has a flat face on one side and a curved face on the other. So if I hit a piece of metal flat, It'll actually make it move, and I'll do something after I get done with this. I'll do something where I'll use the round side, and it'll really, I'll really can show you how the metal will move using this. So take a ball peen, round flat face, ball on the back. So you can really make a pinpoint strike. So say I wanted to, um, I say I had a round piece and I wanted to make it, it was flat, and I wanted to make it curved in order to put like a, for the middle of a candle holder. I could take the ball peen, I could work it right over this hole right here, 
Every time I hit it to the center, it's going to push the center down, the sides are going to go up. Um, and then, of course, there are other tools, kind of their curved hammers, which are uh, called swedge hammers. Um, and you make mortise and tendons using those. You use one like this, and you use one like this. So then you have a big square piece, and you neck it down to make you a square piece that comes up and then it's round, and you drill a hole through another piece and you drop it through, and it makes a rivet and you hammer it flat. Now you have an angle that's connected, and you can do it on the other side and the other side. You do it all the way across and do it across this way. Now you have a window that'll sit in a jail cell. Okay, so I mean, there's a lot of a lot of things, but that's a long answer to your question. But yes, the hammer face has a lot to do with uh, what um, what the uh, the hammer and what the metal will actually um, do. Yes. Most of the work is done with using a flat face of a, of a hammer. Um, but then once you start getting to where a flat face just won't do it anymore, you have to you have to use curved faces and then other other items to get it to uh, to make it spread. And do one and All right, so we're gonna put our loose handle on here real quick. So we can do it in one piece. a wrought iron will do. It's got a lot of grain to it and so you have to keep it at a bright yellow temperature all the time to keep making those fibers lace them on themselves and do it. Wrought iron, I personally hate working in wrought iron. Um, now I have a friend of mine that does a lot of colonial style black looking stuff and he loves working in wrought iron. Um, he's also more patient than I so that's why he, uh, he and I get along so well. So, the stainless isn't curved as much as I like it to, but it's kind of a teardrop, but now we have our handle on there. So we had a nail on the side of our pickle barrel. We could take our pickle, push it to the side of the pickle barrel, catch our pickle, and we got our pickle out, and then we could hang our pickle on the pickle. Oh, we're going to need one of those. Okay. <laughs> All right, so I'll do something decorative. I'll do, I'll do something decorative real quick. Because not everything has to be plain and simple. A lot of times on those, uh, you know, you can do all kind of a uh, twist. There's all kind of different designs you can do. Um, that doesn't really require a hammer to do it. Um, it looks really impressive. But we're going to do a very simple decorative thing that most blacksmiths um, would have done on the end of items, like a fireplace set, something along that line. First thing we've got to do is we've got to put a point right on the end. Everything tends to start, a lot of items tend to start with a point in blacksmith. Okay, so we have our point on the end. Okay, so the next thing we're going to do is we're going to do what's called necking down the material. Since I don't have what's called a guillotine tool in here to do it, that'll do it all the way around, I'm going to do the old way and I'm going to use just the edge of the anvil and I'm actually going to make the material shrink on itself, if that makes any sense. 
And what that does is it isolates a smaller area behind a larger area, and then when you go to work the larger area, you can really make the metal move in the direction you want it to move. If it's the same length, every time you move it, it's going to, it's going to want to move backwards and out and forward. So we're going to make it so we hope that we can only make the material move out and forward. So we're going to neck this down, and we're still using the flat side of our, of our anvil face and our hammer. Now we've necked it down. You see the smaller area there. Now we'll put. Before I get talking too much. Now we're going to heat that end up really good, and now we're really going to make that material. So we're going to mush it out in, in the directions, and in order to do that, we're going to use the curved side of our hammer. That's going to pinpoint that below and really make it move to the outside. We want to get a really good heat on it. We really want it to move. And how thin can I get this? I can get it thinner than a sheet of paper. See how a curved part oh, wow. works versus a flat part? Okay. All right, can anybody take a guess of what this is going to turn out to be? A what? A leaf. A leaf. Right. Mm -hmm. So we could. Leave it kind of beefy on the end, um, and then we can decorate this if we wanted to. They also make good looking candle flames. I actually have a whole metal candle I made at home, and this is painted with an iridescent paint. And it looks like a, <laughs> actually looks like a flame when you do it. So we can heat it up. We can take a chisel. Heat on it. This is pretty short. Pretty cold. And you start cutting our, our veins into it. I'm going to do just a really crude vein today. Because I don't like using this chisel. I have my own veining chisels that I usually use. I don't like being on the anvil. face doing this. This is not the ideal place. You usually don't use your chisels on your anvil face. Moving down here. So if you slip and miss, you don't hit the, the anvil face. So now we have our veins in it. Don't reach out and touch this because it's hot. So now we have our veins cut in it. Sweet. All right, you see our veins. Do not touch. And don't reach up there because trust me, it's hot. All right, you see our veins are cut in it. All right, now are all the leaves, are leaves flat and smooth? They are? Can leaves have curves to them? Well, let's make it curve then. So we're going to curve our leaf. Could we curve the leaf using a hard surface to hammer into? No, we need a soft surface. That's why a lot of times in a lot of like the shop, you'll see stumps sitting around in the shop. Because the wood will actually burn and give as you hammer it. 
So we're going to use a ball peen, again, a different hammer face, and we'll get this leaf to actually curl up. veins and then you see that it's cut on the back side. So can you see we're just outside of veining this? What does this what could this also lead to? If I didn't point this out, I just made a big round spot and then cupped it, what would it make? Make a spoon. It can all be you can have the simplest of the blacksmith tools, and you can turn it off and make it into all kind of different things. I had a spoon laid up here somewhere. So you can make your spoon. And not everything has to be plain and simple like that leaf is. Let's see if I can find another one. Use other leaves. Talk about how thin we can get it. Okay, so you see the stock that we started with. That's how beefy that stock is. Look how thin I can get it. Okay, so it can get really, really, really thin. So you can do a lot. And not only does it have to be something decorative like a leaf, if you have the right tools, you can even make faces. Oh my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> That's so cool. Okay. Looks like an old wizard. Yeah, this is a wizard face. So at Christmas when I make these, because I make you make bottle openers, you cut it and you actually stretch this out and make a bottle opener. So what we do then is we go up and I put a ball on the end, and they become Santa Face bottle openers. Um, you can also cut the hat shorter and hammer it down, and you can make a make it flare out, and he looks like a cowboy. So you can just keep altering it, but you keep using the same the same face over and over. And you make different things. All right, questions about the blacksmith shop? No, yes. Shoot, I know more about this than y'all do. I'm perfectly content right here. You blacksmith? I'm a coppersmith. Oh, awesome. So copper works a little bit differently than uh, yes. mild steel. Copper actually work hardens yes. as you hammer it. So you start